Hello, welcome very much to the Sweden Korea Nobel Memorial Program 2020. Uh, you can follow a stream in Korean or English from the website, uh, so choose your language or preference there. And you can also choose to uh, send in some questions on Slido on the website. So I'm only going to say that before I introduce uh, the host for today, the ambassador, uh, the Swedish ambassador to the Republic of Korea, uh, Jakob Hallgren. Wow, fantastic. We're finally here. Anja Azio. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Jakob Hallgren, as our eminent moderator just said. And it's really my great pleasure to welcome everybody to this symposium on the Sciences Award of the Nobel Prizes this year in 2020. Black holes, genetic scissors, and breakthrough, breakthrough treatments for the global health is the title of this very first session of this inaugural event. So we will hear today from Swedish and Korean experts about their views on the awards, who did them, and how was their work like, and how, what do these achievements actually mean for all of us, and especially maybe in the context of Korea and Sweden. My intention at the embassy here in, in Seoul, Swedish embassy, in organizing this event together with my eminent crew and staff is to create a meeting space for Korean and Swedish people who are curious and interested in science in research. So we hope to reach those of you who are experts, those of you who are interested in the sciences and, and research, but maybe just ordinary curious human beings who might have a life-changing experience of lis by listening to today. So this means that you are all included and everybody is equally welcome to today's event. So, as I said, uh, this symposium and this whole program is organized by the Embassy of Sweden here in Seoul together with our eminent partners, and they are many, so I will not mention all of them, but they are both in Sweden and in Korea. And these partners are all, in one way or another, very important for research or to enable research, both in Korea and Sweden and between our two countries. So I would like to extend my heartfelt uh, uh, gratitude and thanks to all of those you partners who have made this possible today. Now I hope you're really comfortable where you are, where you sit, where you stand, because now I am officially declaring the Sweden-Korea Nobel Memorial Program 2020 open. Whoa! Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, so we turn now to one of the most important persons in research in the Republic of Korea. Himself a distinguished scientist with a long career and a leading authority in the important field of thin film transistors for flat panel displays and solar cells, tremendously important particularly here in Korea. A relentlessly positive and supporting friend of the Swedish Embassy, a thoughtful, considerate and generous person to that. The ninth president to the Korean Academy of Science and Technology, CAST, uh, Emer Professor Emeritus Min Koo Han. Very welcome. Thank you very much for kind introduction. Good, very, very early morning to our Swedish uh, participant. Is it 5 a.m. over there? 5.30, I guess. And good afternoon to Korean participant. And we are very happy that you have this kind of meeting, not only for the offline, but also through the online. It's very like a timely and a very important event. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the Swedish embassy, especially uh, Ambassador Helgren and uh, 
uh, back, uh, back uh, for this wonderful uh, proposal to have this kind of meeting. For the first time, we are very much uh, confident that this should be done, and it should be the way it will be, because we don't have to spend much time at the airport and all the traffic jam, but through the online, all of our participants, not only for the Korea, but also in Swedish, join for this wonderful event. Every early October, the international attention and the publicity are focused to Stockholm, Sweden. You know that. Why? Because the Nobel Prize. Of course, Korea has long been a country with big interest and enthusiasm toward this world's most prestigious award. It is also true that Korea's expectation to win its first scientific Nobel Prize has become greater than ever since several Korean scientists have recently been mentioned as strong candidate as the Nobel laureate. I think the Nobel Memorial Program held at this time is very much timely and meaningful for us to meet our intellectual curiosity about 2020 Nobel Prize. I also hope that by learning the works of a Nobel laureate will give much insight and dream to the Nobel laureate will give much insight to our young scientists and engineers and the students to endeavor their academic uh, uh, interest. We, Sweden and Korea have invited world-renowned scientists in the field of physiology or medicine, physics, and chemistry for this program. I hope that it will be a very precious time for everyone who is attending the Nobel Memorial Program 2020 via online. Lastly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Swedish ambassador and His Excellency Jakob Halgren for all of this effort in organizing this event and to Dr. Hesu Kim, the president of Iwa Univers Women's University for her generous support. And again, I want to say thank you for Korean speakers, Professor Oh, Professor Nam, and uh, Professor Kim, I think he's coming. He's from the next door at Johnson University. Thank you again and have a enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Han, uh, for those kind words and continued support. Uh, universities are uh, tremendously important uh, institutions for international cooperation. So tons of students are going from Korea every year to Sweden and the other way around, and researchers on top of that. Um, we are in the following going to hear welcoming remarks from uh, five universities that are extra important to us as partners. First of all, uh, from uh, the president of uh, Iwa Women's University, Heisu Kim, and that's where we are today at the Iwa Women's University. Uh, then from the president of the University of Gothenburg, Eva Wiberg, followed by the president of the KTH Royal Institute of Technology, uh, Sigrid Karlsson, uh, and then followed by vice chancellor of Lund University, Torbjörn von Schantz, and the final one out is the president of Umeå University, Hans Adolfsson. Please take, uh, uh, pay good attention to these pre presentations because they have important messages for you. On behalf of the EUA community, I would like to take this opportunity to sincerely welcome everyone to this online conference, Sweden-Korea Nobel Memorial Program. I would also like to convey our sincere appreciation to the Swedish Embassy in Korea for organizing this event. Korea has had a long-standing and bountiful relationship with Sweden since 1959. It is thus extremely meaningful that our two nations are collaborating on organizing an event for the first time in Korea to commemorate and celebrate the invaluable significance of the Nobel Prize. It's an honor for IWA to be playing a pivotal role in this monumental event. IWA has continuously interacted with the Swedish institutions in various ways. 
We have welcomed many Swedish students to our campus and sent our students to Sweden. You have also had the pleasure of welcoming distinguished visitors such as Queen Sylvia and co-hosting the Swedish Film Festival every year to raise greater cultural awareness. I have no doubt in that through this event, IWA will further contribute to strengthening bonds between our two nations. IWA has been dedicated to world leading research in science and technology, and we take immense pride in our history of tireless pursuit of academic research in those fields. Historically, during times when the scientific field was rather male-dominated, Iwa nurtured Korea's first female doctor of physics, first female chemist, and paved the path for women intellectuals to equally contribute. Today, Iwa continues to lead in sharing new frontier knowledge through our endeavor in research and innovation and is spearheading the involvement of women in STEM globally. IWA has recently finished constructing two state-of-the-art buildings, the Research Corporation Building and University Industry Corporation Building to provide a dynamic research environment for scholars from around the world and become the hub for global scientific research. I hope you enjoyed the symposium of this year's Nobel Prize for Sciences, as I am proud that several women intellectuals were awarded for the prize this year in physics and chemistry. With engaging panel discussion and speakers who would enlighten the audience with greater insight into this year's prize, I hope you will find this occasion greatly informative and intellectually inspiring, as I have no doubt I will. Thank you. Good morning and good evening, everyone. My name is Eva Weiberg, and I'm the president of the University of Gothenburg. I'm honored and proud that my university is part of this excellent Nobel Memorial Program. And I wish that I could have been with you in person to take part of the presentations. Due to the pandemic, this is of course not possible. The pandemic has brought us many challenges. Perhaps the most important of all for the higher education community is for us to preserve and nurture global conversations like this one between Sweden and South Korea. The University of Gothenburg is a broad and comprehensive university with a strong research focus. One of our strongest research areas is within political science and in public opinion, democracy and elections. In this field of political science, there is also an established research collaboration with Yonsei University. The collaboration is also strong within education where the university has exchanged 200 students with Korean universities over the years. We are hoping that this is only the beginning of an intensified collaboration in education and research with the Korean higher education community. The Nobel Prizes are the greatest celebrations of science. In the year of 2000, the same year when Kim Dae-jung from South Korea was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Arvid Carlson, Professor Emeritus at the University of Gothenburg, was one of three laureates in physiology medicine. A celebration of science, truth and facts, such as the Nobel Prizes, are of increased importance in challenging times when the international community must act jointly to fight a pandemic. It is with pleasure and pride I see the development of this joint collaboration between our two countries. I hope to meet you all in person in Korea during next year's Nobel Memorial Program. KTH is happy to be partner in this event. And in times like this, 
it is even more important to keep connected. KTH is the oldest and largest technical university in Sweden with attractive education and world-leading research. KTH is an international university with some 30% of faculty having international background. Yearly, we have an inflow of about 1,000 international students. Korea is important to KTH for further exchange of students and more of excellent research collaborations. With KTH being an international leading engineering university, we'd like to deepen our collaboration as Korea is a world leading nation in engineering and innovation. I see many similarities and mutual interests. I would like to see more Swedish students going to Korea to tap into the world leading education and research, but also to learn more about the Korean culture. In the coming years, I'd like to see more research collaborations and more of academia and industry collaborations. Being a part of this Nobel Memorial program, I just have to take the possibility to tell you about the real pride for KTH, Hannes Alvén. He is our first but not last Nobel laureate. Professor Alvén got the Nobel Physics Prize in 1970, and he's considered a pioneer in the field of plasma physics, and his discoveries play a crucial role in today's space research. I have visited Korea a couple of times, and it's a fascinating country. Already in 2013, I joined a delegation of Swedish rectors who visited a large number of excellent universities in the Seoul area. I have really enjoyed my stays. I was impressed by the high quality of the universities and the amazing labs for experimental research. I look forward to once again come back to Korea in real life. For us at KTH, this event is an opportunity to further engage KTH in deeper discussions to increase the ties with your wonderful country. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Lund University, it is an honor to welcome you today to this Nobel Memorial Symposia. As two of the world's most innovative countries, Sweden and South Korea have a great deal to learn from each other and many reasons to cooperate. Learn and cooperate on emerging technologies, digitalization and AI and sustainability issues, to name just a few areas. South Korea inspires us in many ways. One example is the large investment in electric roads that Sweden is now making, such as the Evolution Road project here in Lund. This was all inspired by the work KAST has done with inductive electric roads, the so-called OLED project. So collaboration with South Korea is important to Lund University. Last year, we decided on an action plan for collaboration with Asia, and South Korea occupies a prominent place in this work. Here in Lund, we host two of the most advanced research infrastructure projects in Northern Europe, MAX-4 and the European Spallation Source. Such facilities provide a strong foundation for furthering research cooperation with South Korea. It is my hope that the Nobel Memorial Symposia will stimulate increased scientific ties between our countries and between individual researchers. I am glad that you are joining us for this event and I wish you all success. Dear friends of Korea and Sweden, Greetings from Umeå and Umeå University. My name is Hans Adelson and I'm the Vice Chancellor at Umeå University. And as the university, we are very happy to be part of the Swedish-Korean Nobel Memorial Program today. Umeå University has been collaborating with the Swedish Embassy in Seoul since 2013. We currently have seven partner universities in Korea and would like to establish additional partnerships and to extend the relationships regarding research collaborations. Umeå University's strong research areas include, for example, global health, infection biology, plant and forest biotechnology, aging and population studies, and research connected to the Arctic regions. My personal professional background is within chemistry and therefore I am especially proud that the groundbreaking discovery 
which is awarded this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry, began at a laboratory here at the Umeå University. The CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissors, one of the gene technology's sharpest tools, was discovered by Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna. At the time of the discovery, Emmanuel Charpentier was a group leader here at MIMS, the Laboratory of Molecular Infection Medicine Sweden at our university, in fact, over there. She often mentions Umeå as a place where she really could focus on her research and that it was a great platform for networking and sharing ideas. I personally had the opportunity to visit Seoul in 2014 and it was a great experience. Therefore, I also look forward to visiting Korea again and hopefully next year's Nobel Memorial Program can take place in Seoul. So, with that, enjoy today's meeting and do take care. Thanks. Thank you very much for these uh, nice messages and uh, we heard that uh, they will all come here for the Nobel Memorial next year. We look forward to that very much so. The first category that we're going to go through is uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. Now, this must be the most important of the Nobel Prizes since it concerns health, care and well-being and what could possibly be more important than that. We have several speakers, as President Han said earlier, that have risen early today. And uh, the one that raised, uh, went up the first is uh, Professor Matthias Ullén. Professor Ullén is a renowned academic with impressive scientific achievements, and he is also a serial entrepreneur and innovator. He holds some 80 patents, and he has started more than 20 companies, at least one of them I'm familiar with here in Seoul. And he is the founder of the SciLife Lab and the Human Protein Atlas. No bad achievements. And these are both important institutions in Sweden. Please welcome Professor Matthias. So, uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, so, I am very honored then to be part of this event. Uh, and I would like then to, let's see, should I share my screen to give you, uh, uh, to, get, to see, so you can see my PowerPoint? Or how does that work? Uh, Apparently, I get... no. I think uh, we have the presentation here. Okay, so please show the first slide then. And it's coming up and I let us know, Matthias, if you can see it on your screen as well. Uh, yes, let's see. Can you... S uh, I cannot see it, actually. Okay, here we go. So, thank you very much. So, uh, I'm Professor Matthias Ullin. I am. Uh, I was the founding director of the Science for Life Laboratory. I have been many, many, many times in Korea. I think around 30 or 40 times. Um, and what I would like to talk about today is the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. Uh, so, this year, this was awarded to three gentlemen, Harvey Walter, uh, Michael Newton, and Charles, Charles Rice, for the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. And uh, the background for this is, of course, that hepatitis C virus gives liver diseases. It, was, it has been transmitted through blood uh, transfusions. It's an RNA virus, so this is quite familiar for this year's pandemic. Um, uh, and it starts with a chronic hepatitis and then it moves into cirrhosis for the patients and finally some of them get liver cancer, but it can take up to 30 years. So what I would thought I would do, I would give you a background, but first a little bit about the prize. Um, so Alfred Nobel in his testament in the early 1900, uh, he actually wrote down that uh, one of the prizes should be in physiology or medicine. Uh, he gave the prize, the, uh, the awardee to, to the Karolinska Institute. And you can see here a picture from the Karolinska Assembly in 1910. So um, next slide, please. 
Uh, so the selection procedure uh, uh, now is that uh, no, th nominations are invited uh, in, this, in the fall right now, and before the January 30, 31st, uh, the, the um, nominations has to come in. And then the nominations are evaluated during the spring, uh, uh, put together before the summer, and then there is the uh, Nobel Committee then uh, reports this to the Nobel Assembly at the Karolinska Institute in August and September. And then, as you might, as, as was mentioned, the prize is given the first Monday on October, or it's announced the first Monday in October, and then uh, the prize is given at the, uh, at the Nobel Day, December 10. The science between uh, this year's prize then uh, is that one gentleman, researcher Harvey Alter, was working at a blood transfusion in, in, uh, in, uh, in Bethesda at NIH, and he found that uh, in the mid-70s found that the transmission of the hepatitis from blood could not be due to hepatitis B, that was thought at the time, another virus. Uh, but must be caused by an unknown virus. However, it took more than 10 years before this virus was identified, and in the meanwhile, it was called the non-A, non-B hepatitis. And this is where Michael Hewton came in. In 1987, at a company in California, Chiron, he used a new technology. Can you please go back, actually? Uh, he used the, um, the, um, the, the new technology of molecular cloning then to characterize this virus uh, and then were able then to develop a serological test. This was a major breakthrough uh, and allowed blood tests to be developed to detect blood donors infected with hepatitis C. The risk of hepatitis from blood transfusions actually then went from almost 30% in the 70s to close to 0% uh, in, in 2000. The third researcher that is awarded with the prize this year is Charles Rice. Uh, and his contribution was in the 90s, so he started cultivating the virus, and in 1997 he was able to take a cultivated virus and infect uh, in chimpanzees. This is also a very major achievement because that meant that the virus could be studied in laboratories, uh, setting the scene to actually make antiviral drugs uh, could be developed. Next slide, please. So this is quite unusual. The pioneering work for this uh, year's prize in medicine uh, actually was extended over more than 20 years, and I think that's quite unusual. Usually the prize is given to discoveries which are usually taking place in a rather short time, time period, but here this was extended over, uh, over more than two decades. Uh, so, uh, the, but the Nobel Prizes are given to uh, discovered that gives benefit for human mankind. And this is very, very clear in this case. Um, I here listed three different benefits that we have got from these, uh, this year's prize. First of all, increased scientific knowledge. And in this case, this is an RNA virus. And it is, of course, important to know a lot about the RNA viruses. Can you please go back? Yes. Um, uh, in order to then uh, uh, know more about uh, how they work and so on, and especially maybe a year like this when we have a pandemic and we have another RNA virus which is, is causing so much problems, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but secondly, the prize then gave us the possibility to develop sensitive hepatitis C virus tests, and this has been very, very important for the uh, scientific, for the for the clin clinical uh, community, where you know don't have any risk anymore to get hepatitis when you're getting a blood transfusion. But then third, and maybe most uh, important, is that these innovations gave us the possibility to create effective antiviral drugs. So with that, I'm going to show, yes, you can go back to this slide then. 
so so uh, so um, we are very happy then to uh, so so this prize then has given us benefits for mankind next slide please so before i then end the i just it's wanted to show you a movie from the liver and growth here we explore the liver using 3d light sheet microscopy we are inside one of the portal veins that run in parallel with the hepatic artery and the bile duct here the blood flows from the intestine to the liver So this was a movie just to uh, show you, uh, yeah, you can go to the, the next liver slide, produces biochemicals necessary for digestion slide, and please. growth. Here, Next slide, please. Yes. Okay. So uh, with that, I want to thank you for listening to this very short presentation about this year's Nobel Prizes in Physiology or Medicine. Uh, to Harvey Alter, Michael Newton, and Charles Rice for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. Uh, and then before I end, I just wanted to uh, thank you all for listening and also hope that next year we can maybe meet in, in, in South Korea. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Olean. And please stay with us. We hope we can come back to you for a, a conversation uh, after a while. Uh, but first, I'm honored and glad to welcome our next speaker to you uh, on this important award, Professor Yu Kyang Oh. Let me get out of the way since I don't have a face mask right now. <laughs> we want to treat. Uh, keep you could sit uh, over there. Thank you. Uh, we want to keep the, the, the distancing, uh, but still show our facial expressions. Um, Professor Ogat her PhD at the University of Buffalo, a very cold city, but you will be familiar with that coming from here. Uh, a member of the Sunni family, and Professor O continued at Harvard before coming back to Korea. And today she is a professor at Seoul National University at the College of Pharmacy. She is a fellow of CAST and, a very act and very active in several international journals in the field of pharmacy. A very well, warm welcome to you, Professor Orr. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Dr. Hector, for a very nice and warm introduction. And I'm very honored to be here as a speaker for, for explaining the uh, Nobel story. I will now uh, start my lecture on the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine 2020. Good afternoon. I am currently a professor at the Pharmaceutical College of Seoul National University. I am Oh Yu Gyeong. Uh, today, I would like to talk about the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And I will talk about the subject under the title of Unveiling Secrets of the Silent Killer. Uh, first of all, let us uh, watch the announcement of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine at uh, the Karolinska Institute. So, the Nobel Assembly at Karolinska Institute has today decided to award the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine jointly to Harvey J. Alter, Michael Horton, and Charles M. Rice for the discovery of hepatitis C virus. Uh, as you saw, uh, the international community's attention uh, was uh, there at the announcement uh, of the 2020 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And as you just saw, uh, three gentlemen uh, received uh, this uh, auspicious award. Uh, and uh, they are uh, Harvey J. Alter of the National Institute of Health and also Michael Houghton, University of Alberta, Canada, and also Dr. Rice, Charles M. Rice of Rockefeller University, USA. And they received the award for the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. Um, and actually, uh, the hepatitis is a global health uh, burden. According to a WHO report, uh, 
every year, 325 million people globally live uh, with a hepatitis uh, infection. And then what is uh, hepatitis? Uh, literally, hepatitis refers to the inflammation of uh, the liver. And uh, hepatitis can be uh, divided into two types, acute hepatitis and chronic hepatitis. In the case of acute hepatitis, uh, the uh, infection naturally clears uh, within six months, generally speaking. And so uh, it is not uh, that clinically important. But when it comes to chronic hepatitis, uh, it can develop into cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma without the patient even realizing uh, that their condition is that serious. And this is why uh, it is called the silent killer. Uh, if you look at how uh, viral hepatitis occurs, uh, it, it can be triggered by uh, viruses, but uh, and the virus, uh, viral hepatitis, is one of the main causes. And uh, there is uh, hepatitis A, which occurs uh, because of infection of uh, a type uh, virus, and uh, this is transmitted through oral intake of contaminated food or water. When it comes to chronic hepatitis, it uh, is usually transmitted uh, via blood. Uh, so it, this means that you can get this disease by poking yourself uh, with a needle or by a blood a transfusion. Uh, but there are very rare cases in which you poke yourself uh, with a needle. So most of the infections come uh, from blood transfusions. And in 1976, uh, Dr. Baruch Bloomberg uh, discovered uh, the hepatitis B virus and uh, receives a Nobel uh, Prize of uh, Physiology and Medicine uh, for uh, his uh, work. And. Uh, Around this time, Dr. Harvey J. Alter uh, observed uh, that there were patients uh, uh, that came to him who received blood transfusions who developed uh, chronic hepatitis, uh, but their hepatitis was not hepatitis A or hepatitis B. And so he uh, wondered why or what caused uh, uh, chronic hepatitis other than A or B. And uh, this uh, was uh, basically his paper. So he asked the question, why are patients developing non-A, non-B hepatitis? Is there another infectious agent? And so Dr. Alter designed an important experiment to answer this question. He collected uh, the blood of non-A, non-B chronic hepatitis patients and injected this into healthy chimpanzees. What do you think happened? The results of this creative research was published in the renowned medical journal, The Lancet, in 1978. And so he proved that there was a third transmissible agent uh, of uh, chronic hepatitis. But uh, it took uh, years in identifying what this unknown transcible agent uh, was. And uh, Dr. Michael Houghton, uh, he encouraged or he led a antigen and antibody reaction between the blood of infected chimpanzees and uh, patients with uh, chronic hepatitis. And uh, he uh, created uh, a library of uh, highly concentrated uh, uh, virus protein of infected uh, chimpanzees. If you look at the slide, I have only 10 samples. But uh, what is notable is that uh, this was arduous work because he had to work with over 1 million samples. And I found that this was uh, quite expressive, impressive. So he screened millions of uh, to eventually isolate a single HCV clone. And so he shared uh, the results
fruits uh, of his uh, study. But there was still one remaining puzzle uh, that was left. Uh, uh, the last piece of the puzzle was whether the hepatitis C virus alone was sufficient to cause chronic hepatitis. And so Dr. Charles M. Rice uh, injects in vitro RNA transcript uh, to the infected chimpanzees. And he observed what happened. What do you think happened? And according to his uh, study in 1997, uh, when inoculated with transcribed RNA, uh, the HCV uh, increased uh, in the chimpanzees, and they all showed signs of uh, chronic hepatitis. So he proved that the hepatitis virus C alone could actually cause the disease it was thought to cause. So as you can see, there were three uh, pieces uh, to the hepatitis C virus uh, puzzle. So in 1978, Dr. Harvey Alter discovered that there was a third form of infection agent that caused chronic hepatitis. Then in 1989, Dr. Houghton identified the transmissible agent as the hepatitis C virus. And then in 1997, Dr. Charles Rice proved that the virus alone caused uh, the uh, disease. And as a result of their work, we can now not only prevent but also treat hepatitis uh, C uh, virus. In preparing for this uh, lecture, I thought about uh, what kind of qualities uh, Nobel laureates have. And I went through a number of articles and papers, and I condensed uh, the qualities that are needed in laureates into the following four. The first, of course, is creativity. And uh, But as you saw in the case of Dr. Michael Houghton, you also need uh, persistence and perseverance. He found a single clone out of more than one million samples. And you also need to uh, collaborate because uh, you need to collaborate with other researchers. So you need an open mind to collaboration. And uh, the last uh, uh, factor or quality was uh, humor and wit and just enjoying the process. I'm sure you're familiar with the saying uh, that uh, you cannot win or beat somebody who enjoys uh, their work. And of course, even if you have these four qualities, it doesn't guarantee that uh, you will receive a Nobel Prize. However, I believe that uh, these four qualities will enable you to become a good researcher. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Oh, That was really exciting to take part of and you really describe uh, the process uh, as an adventure which is uh, really fascinating and I can imagine that uh, it is an adventure uh, at, an exciting at least part of the time uh, but uh, I'm interested uh, you also alluded to that it would take uh, it took quite long time mm -hmm. the research projects uh, were going on for years and the data uh, would uh, would be uh, eluding you. Uh, is that normal? Uh, how much is it uh, long time, long processes before you find uh, results and, and uh, before you get the adventure perhaps and the excitement? Uh, well, uh, I think I can speak in Korean because there is Please. translator. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes to research projects, uh, I think that patience and time is very important. But if you look at the Korean research environment, we tend uh, to have mandatory reports every three years or every one year. And, and there are some cases where you feel the pressure when you don't have any results to uh, report on. And uh, I think in, that is why Michael Houghton's uh, research uh, is that meaningful. Because as I understand, he went through uh, seven to eight years of uh, failed experiments. And I was quite envious that he was able uh, to receive uh, support and funding for the seven to eight years that uh, he was experiencing failure. And I think that that sort of long-term support will be important in uh, future Korean scientists uh, having the potential to uh, uh, get a Nobel Prize. Do you recognize this, uh, the description? Is the, will the process be looking the same uh, in a Swedish uh, or European context? Well, I couldn't hear the Korean part, but, but obviously I think it's very, very common that research takes a long time 
and the process uh, is you have to be very patient and uh, and uh, but f for the nobel prize this is actually quite unique normally nobel prizes are given for pioneering efforts and this is pioneering efforts but i would still say that this is quite unusual to have the pioneering efforts extended over 20 years. It is kind of interesting that part of the delay might have been another virus that came in the early 80s, and that was the AIDS virus and HIV, and that took a lot of attention. But I still think that this is, uh, it's a very nice example where three researchers from different fields in very different environments actually together make this uh, discovery and actually helps mankind with new drugs, new diagnostics and new, new knowledge. Would you say also that um, they were aware of each other? They, there were three pieces that each of them were tremendously important for, for the whole solution. Uh, but the, were they working on defined pieces when they were working on this problem? Or were they... Well, all of them were actually working in, in several fields and hepatitis C just happened to be one of the fields that they were working on. And it's interesting that they are very different in, in because the, the, um, one of the researchers was in a blood bank, uh, which is, you know, uh, something that is very much service for the community. One was actually at the time in a company and did the discovery as part of the company. And one of them was in a very distinguished research uh, university. So, so uh, I'm sure that they were uh, aware of what they have done, but probably only through literature and, and publications. Uh, so it is, in that sense, a little bit unique, this Nobel Prize. Yeah. Professor Orr, you shared this image. Uh, I believe that the award uh, this year is more significant because uh, generally when you receive uh, a Nobel Prize, uh, uh, mostly, especially when you receive the prize with others, uh, they are usually of the same generation and they usually carry out uh, the research uh, during the same time. But in this case, they carried out the research in different time frames. And although they did not directly collaborate uh, with each other, they used uh, papers and literature, which is a communication tool uh, for researchers. And they used this tool tool to uh, overcome the boundaries of time and space uh, to collaborate in a way. And I think that this is meaningful. Uh, looking closer to home, so to speak, all of them would, uh, I guess, be having their own labs that they were working at and teams that they would be working with. Uh, can you say something about how, how that looks? Uh, is there, they would be the research leaders uh, as, as the most senior leaders and there would be other roles uh, in, in the lab as well. How important is the team for achievements like this? Is it the individual or is it the team? I guess it's different. <laughs> Professor Ullian, you could start. No, I think the team is very important. The environment that you're working on is very important. And also, as uh, pointed out by Professor O, oh, also the collaborations, international collaborations are important. And this is, of course, one of the reasons why it's so important to have collaborations like we also have between South Korea. Korea and, and Sweden. So the teams are very important. Uh, you, uh, in order to be a successful scientist, you have to have the knowledge, you have to have the technology, but you also have to have the best network in order to, to achieve what you, uh, great things. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, please, Professor Orr. 
Uh, on my last slide, I talked about the pathway to receiving a Nobel Prize, and I talked about how one important quality was being open to collaboration. And I think collaborating with your immediate research teammates uh, is the first step toward uh, collaborating uh, with others. Uh, in our lab, uh, we have pairs of uh, researchers who work together. So you need to be able to work with your partners within your team first in order to collaborate with people outside your team. And so the first step is to be able to collaborate with your coworkers and then to collaborate with scientists and other fields. Uh, and so recently, if you look at the research that is going on, you can see many interdisciplinary research projects going on. For instance, uh, pharmaceutical studies along with engineering studies and other different fields. And this can expand the field and the research field. Uh, I guess there are bigger and smaller research questions uh, that you can work with. Uh, w would you say like in, mat in mathematics there is a list of uh, uh, hard problems that remains to be solved? Uh, is there something similar in the life sciences as well where you have, and I'm not thinking of curing cancer, but something more specific than that. Is there like a list of uh, hard problems uh, that haven't been solved that can also serve as uh, inspiration for uh, aspiring researchers or uh, maybe even aspiring uh, Nobel laureates? Uh, Professor Ulian. Okay, well, I think that in life science and medical research, we are in the most exciting area in history because we are starting now to understand a more holistic view of human biology and human medicine. Uh, and I think that we have got in the last three or four, uh, no, th three or four decades, uh, fantastic tools to actually explore uh, life science uh, and medical research. And one of these tools is, was the, uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry that you will hear about uh, very soon. Um, and with these tools, but also this new era of big data and artificial intelligence and data-driven life science, I think that we will then move into an era where we can actually make a, a systematic analysis of human biology and then also try to tackle very complicated diseases. So I think uh, I would be very happy to be a young scientist today in this field because there are so much you can do with this new technology, this new knowledge and this new data. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. Professor Orr, do you have a list? Yes. Uh, yeah, Jika. As of 2019, uh, with many countries uh, facing uh, an aging society, I think there are uh, issues related to Alzheimer's, uh, issues related to aging uh, that can be solved. In 2020, as we enter the uh, COVID uh, era, I think we can add one more issue to that list. How can we respond swiftly with scientific means to these fast-changing viruses? How can we develop vaccines? If you look at viruses today, they have many different subtypes and it mutates very swiftly. So how can we uniformly prevent these viruses? How can we treat these viruses? So I think that how we are going to respond to future pandemics is something that we can add to this list. A very important uh, project, like uh, putting a man on the moon type of project, and uh, probably very good if we could come together to, to solve it like that. Um, we have uh, encouraged uh, people that are participating online to suggest questions. Uh, if there is a question, there are a couple of questions. Okay, let's see if we can pick uh, one or two of these. Yeah, the first one, how does this year's award-winning study have anything to do with the corona vaccine development? Is anybody, any one of you, uh, Professor Orm? 
아, 예, 이번 올해의 그 연구 결과는 결국 바이러스. I think that uh, the work of the recipients this year. Uh, was significant uh, because uh, three uh, scientists worked together to solve uh, the problem related to a single virus over time. So I'm sure that the coronavirus will seem like a mountain that is insurmountable, but I believe that going through the same phases, we will be able to tackle this virus uh, in the future. Yeah, I think that it's actually very interesting to compare because both of these viruses are RNA viruses. They are actually causing a lot of human harm. Uh, and it's interesting then what has happened with science because hepatitis C, then it took almost 20 years before the we know about the virus until we had uh, uh, sort of uh, good diagnostics and, and good uh, uh, treatments. What was happening with the coronavirus now, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, is very different. We have only known this virus for, I guess, about a year. Uh, and now we have uh, thousands and thousands of publications. Uh, we have very good diagnostics. And I think we will then very soon have a vaccine. Uh, so it kind of shows how science has moved on. We have very, very much better technologies to study such a pandemic, uh, and we are much quicker. Uh, but I think uh, many of us thought, uh, would like it to be even more qu quicker, but at least it's not taking 20 years as it took for hepatitis C virus. So, uh, but I think it's, it's very relevant to compare. We should also remember that the knowledge that these awardees actually got us with, this, uh, with, these, uh, with their um, science actually help us now when we're trying to combat the coronavirus. Okay. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much for your time. This is too little time to be talking about uh, important issues like this, but unfortunately, that's the way it is. So, Professor Jo Kyung Oh, thank you very much, and Professor Matthias Olin, thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you. Thank you. And we are now moving to another uh, Nobel Prize category altogether, uh, and this is the prize in physics, which is, I think, the most important prize in the Nobel, category, Nobel Prize category, because it all starts and ends with physics and includes the rules, and it's the only discipline that is striving to formulate a theory of everything, and what could possibly be more important than that. So I turn now to Professor Anna Delin, online in Stockholm. You were awarded for the best Swedish doctoral thesis in physics, and you got the Thureus Prize for significant contributions in the theory of nanomagnetism. And you are a fellow of the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, no less. Today, you are a professor at, uh, uh, of computational nanomagnetism, which is an interesting combination of words, I must say. And there may turn up one or two questions about that from the audience. Very welcome, Professor Anna Delin. Thank you. So I'm waiting for the screen share to be enabled, because um, I can't share my screen. I'll try again. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. OK, they heard that, so they are signaling it should be working. I think. Try again. Yes, that works. Okay. Lovely. Great. <laughs> see my slides? I can see your slide, but I'm not online. Okay. <clears throat> Can you see your slides? Yeah, great, then I start. Okay. Thanks a lot for having me, inviting me to this very interesting event. 
I've not yet had the pleasure to visit Korea in person, but it's definitely on my wish list. I have the honor to present to you this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. This year, the Nobel Prize in Physics is awarded for fundamental discoveries and predictions relating to so-called black holes. So what is a black hole? In short, when a very heavy star collapses, it can form a black hole. A black hole has such a large gravity pull that not even light can leave it. Therefore, we can't see black holes directly. However, they can be detected indirectly by the way stars move around them. Here you see an animation of how real stars move at the center of our galaxy. You can see that they seem to move around an invisible object. This mysterious object is called Sagittarius A star. The fastest moving star in the image, called star S2, that's the big blue star in the center, orbits this invisible object in just 15 years. For comparison, it takes our sun 200 million years to go around the center of our galaxy. Dinosaurs were walking on Earth when we started the current lap. Let's look a bit closer on the structure of a black hole. It has an event horizon at some distance from the center, the singularity of the black hole. The structure of a black hole is very much related to the structure of space and time itself. A black hole is a region in space and time that is so warped and curved that it's impossible to find your way out again. When you reach the boundary, the so-called event horizon, the direction of time points inwards towards the center. To escape the black hole, we would need to travel backwards in time, which is impossible. And in the center of the black hole, time ends. Interestingly, any object, no matter how light, can become a black hole, if you can figure out a way to compress it down to below the critical radius, also called the Schwarzschild radius. At that point, what happens? At that point, gravity wins. Gravity wins over all known forces, and the object is forced to continue to collapse into an infinitely small object or point. And then it's a black hole. If we were to compress the Earth down to the size of a sugar cube, it would become a black hole. Half of the prize is awarded to Roger Penrose, a mathematician and theoretical physicist. The other half of the prize, let's see, there. The other half of the prize is awarded jointly to Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez, who are both astronomers. I will now present all three awardees in more detail. Roger Penrose at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom is awarded the prize for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. The keyword here is robust. Penrose developed his proof in the middle of the 1960s. Already half a century earlier, as Albert Einstein presented his theory of general relativity, it had been pointed out that the theory in principle allowed singularities in space-time, what we now call black holes. But it remained pure theoretical speculation, since it seemed that such singularities could only exist in a very ideal, unrealistic situation, where stars and their black holes were perfectly round and symmetrical. Interestingly, several hundred years ago already, Mathematicians and physicists, in fact, speculated that dark stars could perhaps form heavenly bodies so dense that not even light would be able to escape. But it was not until Penrose developed the new mathematical concept of trapped surfaces, and with the help of that, proved the singularity theorem, that we could understand that black holes can actually form under realistic conditions and could perhaps even be quite common in the universe. Once Penrose's proof was published, the hunt was on to observe such a black hole. 
a bit tricky since they are invisible. The final success of that long hunt is the subject of the other half of this year's Nobel Prize in Physics, which goes to the leaders of two research groups. Both chose to focus on the object I already mentioned, called Sagittarius A star at the center of our galaxy, about 26,000 light years from our solar system. And they started their work in the 1990s, some 30 years after the publication of Penrose's proof. Sagittarius A star was strongly suspected to be a giant black hole at that time, but nobody had been able to prove it experimentally. Reinhard Genzel at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching, Germany, and University of California, Berkeley, USA, is awarded the prize for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. These observations were made using two telescopes in Chile, the New Technology Telescope, NTT, and later the Very Large Telescope Facility, VLT. Andrea Ghez at the University of California, Los Angeles, USA, is awarded the prize with the same motivation, that is, for the discovery of a supermassive compact object at the center of our galaxy. Her observations were made using a telescope in Hawaii, the Keck telescope. Since the 1990s, Gez and Gensel have each led groups that have mapped the orbits of stars close to the center of our galaxy. You saw before how these stars are moving in the animation I showed. The studies led them to conclude that an extremely massive, invisible object must be dictating the star's frantic movements. This object, known as Sagittarius A star, is the most convincing evidence yet of a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. Its mass is estimated to be about 4 million solar masses squeezed into a region about the size of our solar system. To observe the motion of these stars with high enough precision, these groups have developed extremely sophisticated techniques, so-called adaptive optics, which have increased the resolution of the telescopes a thousandfold. Their techniques correct for the air's turbulence using extra mirrors and sensitive digital light sensors. The result of their work is that we can now observe those stars with the high precision you see in this animation. The pioneering work of Reinhard Gensel and Andrea Ghez has led the way for new generations of precise tests of the general theory of relativity and its most bizarre predictions. The hope is that these measurements will also be able to provide clues for new theoretical insights. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Delin. That was uh, very, very interesting. Black holes are is a, a constant source for fascination. I would like to welcome up to the stage, please, um, um, uh, Professor uh, San Kon Nam. Very welcome. Uh, you have been at uh, Yale University in the United States, and you're now at the professor of the, uh, a professor at the Department of Physics uh, at the Kyungi University. And you are a provost. Uh, being a provost, you may not have very much time to do research, I'm assuming, uh, but I'm happy that you're able to keep updated with the Nobel Prize to the extent uh, that you can participate here. And uh, I see that you're interested in, in uh, string theory and black holes, not only interested in much more than that. A very warm welcome. Welcome to Professor Song Kyung Nam. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a uh, kind uh, introduction. Uh, and hello, everyone uh, in Sweden and Korea. I'm going to uh, give the presentation in Korean. So, uh, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics went to Professor Roger Penrose for his theoretical development in the study of black holes and also to Reinhard Genzel and Andra Ghez for their observational discoveries. I believe that you already heard some explanations about this year's award, so maybe there may be some overlapping content. 
Specifically, Penrose mathematically proved that the formation of black hole is inevitable based on the theory of general relativity, whereas Genzel and Gaze proved that there is an existence of a supermassive object at the center of our galaxy through their astronomical observation. Professor Gaze became the fourth woman in the world to receive the Nobel Prize in Physics. In 1915, Einstein's theory of general relativity, relativity came out, and Schwarzschild found a solution to black holes with spherical symmetry in 1916. He found a solution where the center of a black hole with infinite gravitational force was surrounded by an event horizon that seemed to stop in time. And there is infinite gravity at the center surrounded by the event horizon. So despite the solution to these Einstein's equation of general relativity, many physicists, including Einstein himself, did not believe that black holes would really exist. Nevertheless, in 1939, Oppenheimer and Snyder of the United States showed that Dust, which had been distributed in a perfectly spherical shape, could pull together by gravity to form black holes. Nevertheless, many people thought that there would be no such thing as a perfect spherical symmetrical dust distribution, so they would not be able to get together perfectly in one center. And in particular, Soviet physicists at the time tried to make it seem impossible in real life. Until the late 1950s, many people were skeptical about the real existence of black holes. Even Wheeler of the United States, who coined the term black hole, did not believe in its existence. A discovery that changed the situation was made in the early 1960s. This is because celestial bodies called quasars have begun to be discovered with radio telescopes. So there are lots of theories about what this really is. And one of that is that these are supermassive black holes with masses of millions, hundreds of times the mass of the sun. And radio waves are emitted when surrounding gas is sucked in. So against this backdrop, in 1964, Penrose, who was a mathematician, began to think about proving the existence of black holes according to the general theory of relativity. He asked the question whether a black hole can only form if there is a symmetry. He approached this problem not from the perspective of equation solving, but based on his geometric and topological intuition. In other words, he tried to solve this problem of physics by drawing a picture. In 1965, he published a very short two-page paper in Physical Review Letters, and he showed that in general relativity theory, the formation of black holes is inevitable. In other words, he mathematically proved that a black hole will eventually form even if the object is not in a perfect sphere distribution. So he proved that the singularity theorem, that black holes must have a singularity no matter how they are made. It means that there is no need for special conditions such as spherical symmetry that previously troubled many scholars. So let me just tell you the points of his singularity theorem. All substances that have energy pull each, each other by gravity. The two objects that initially ran in parallel are also pulled by each other's gravity. Light is no exception. According to general relativity uh, theory, the coordinates of time and space are the same as the grid paper, but the grid paper is bent by gravity. The grid paper is made of latitudinal and longitudinal lines. No matter how curved the paper is, the lines in the same direction will not meet each other. But Penrose proved that inside a black hole, these lines collide with each other. In other words, it showed that a singular point at which 
the coordinates end was created. And the most important concept in Penrose proof is the concept of a closed trapped surface. This trapped surface is a closed two-dimensional surface, and all light trajectories existing perpendicular to this surface are always converging with each other. This is opposite to what happens normally. Light that goes out of the sphere goes out all in all directions. So Penrose showed that when the trapped surface exists, singularity must exist. And Penrose proved the existence of a singularity using a mathematical regression method. So he showed that black holes can inevitably form if this, these conditions are met. However, as you might have heard through the previous presentation, Astronomical observation is not easy because the stars are shining in the sky and you may have seen them uh, twinkling. So we need special kind of technology to correct the image of the starlight. So the method these scholars chose was to fire a laser 90 kilometers above the ground in the direction of the star you want to see. And the technology will correct the atmospheric movement about 2,000 times per second. And this allowed the researchers to take a picture of stars with 10 times higher resolution than not using the technology. Using this adaptive optics uh, technology, Andra Ghez was able to separate and observe several stars in the center of our galaxy through the Keck telescope in Hawaii. So what are some of the homeworks remaining? The answer to the question of whether the singularity of mathematical infinity is real in the physical universe, as I said, the singularity that must exist within general relativity may rather show the limitation of general relativity in explaining our universe. So for the past 30 years, scholars have been searching for a new theory that can really solve these questions. I have also been studying this issue for the past 30 years. And when it comes to observation, linking multiple telescopes on Earth will provide a practical Earth-sized telescope. And we are trying to improve the resolution of these telescopes for more precise research. Now I would like to move on to some of the research that are going on in Korea. There are many scholars in Korea who are trying to study this field. There are lots of string theorists in Korea, and also there are scholars studying the theories of quantum gravity. And as an important antenna that detects the signal coming from the black holes, there is an antenna being developed which detects the gravitational wave coming from the black holes. And also uh, a group of researchers from the United States LIGO Institute received the Nobel Prize for their research on gravitational waves. So many scholars are also participating in this kind of research. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. And uh, good to see you, Professor Delane, that you're still with us. Uh, two fascinating presentations, I must say. Can I just uh, make a control question? Mm -hmm. Professor Delin, you mentioned that if Earth was compressed to the size of a sugar cube, it would collapse to a black hole. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would be the size of the black hole? I understand the sugar cube would uh, implode or compress uh, into yeah, a singularity so then? or In this classical theory, 
in the classical form, it will be a singularity, so we'll have zero size. Zero size. Okay. But I'm challenged to wrap my head around that. <laughs> that's because it's a classical theory. And in reality, there's surely, I mean, there must exist a combination of or we can uh, reconcile quantum mechanics with the general relativity and it will not be a true singularity, probably. <laughs> that's what people are working on since many de de decades. Okay, so Professor Nam, what what would your best bet be? And and uh, Professor Delin, please consider that as well. Uh, the the Sagittarius A that uh, has um, uh, I don't remember what you call it, the size of our solar system, which is not the size of the physical thing of the black hole. Uh, is that black hole also a, a singularity which doesn't have any mass or, or doesn't, rather doesn't have any physical existence? Yeah, so let me clear, uh, make it clear. Uh, black holes are surrounded by so-called event horizon. After crossing that, you can never come back. So whenever we say, well, what's the size of a black hole, is the si radius of that event horizon. Inside that event horizon, at the center, we have zero size singularity. So that's the, the size of the uh, 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 zero volume that uh, Professor Del Delin has said. Mm. Now, so big black holes such as the uh, one at the uh, center of our galaxy could be as big as our solar system. But if we compress our Earth, for example, it could be very, very small, even smaller than an atom that might be. Yeah. And then uh, the real uh, nature of that singularity is so something is of a biggest puzzle, which needs the theory of everything, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> and that a lot of people are working on that. Uh, what is the uh, smallest size, Professor Delin, the smallest size of an object that could, uh, from a natural causes, so to speak, become a black hole? Uh, could our sun become a black hole, or is it uh, too small for that? I think the sun is a bit too small. I think you need uh, some multiple. I'm not sure which one, maybe 10. There is uh, the the pressure of, uh, uh, of atomic force prevents it from collapsing. So we need a big enough assault, uh, object. Usually we say that's about four times the minimum size is about four times of the solar mass. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. This is a little bit uh, challenging <laughs> for me, I must say. Uh, but uh, it's uh, nevertheless uh, relentlessly interesting. So, so another uh, seventh grade uh, level question then perhaps, which is what I am capable of. Uh, the, is the Sagittarius A uh, eating the, the Milky Way? Is everything eventually falling into the, the black uh, hole in the center of, uh, and, and how long time will that take? Yeah, so uh, what prevents uh, things to fall into is that it's uh, rotating around it. If it's pulling toward, I mean, the Earth is pulling towards uh, uh, the center, but if we set, uh, put a satellite around it, it just goes around and around because it's rotating. So as long as something is rotating around it, it's not sucked in immediately. So, but, and uh, if it's pretty far away, it's not going to uh, uh, suck everything in. So it's, I, I don't think uh, the, that Sagittarius A will suck uh, the solar system in in a, a foreseeable future. So the centrifugal force of, of right, exactly. spinning yeah. or, 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 okay, maybe that's the wrong term. But. Also, the space time is very warped close to the black hole, so that um, the, it, we see it as a very long time for things to fall in actually goes to infinity. That's true. Right. That's also true, yeah. Okay. When you are working on these uh, issues, these problems, uh, are, they, are they mathematical problems to you, or, or, or geometrical, or physical, or, or what is your way of, what's your language to conceptualize these uh, problems and the so solutions? For me, it's most um, a theoretical and mathematical approach one can take because uh, one is trying to build up, uh, devise a new theory in some sense. But there are other people who work uh, about the uh, 
astrophysical aspects around the real phys uh, physical black holes. So those are, there are these uh, astrophysicists who do that, and they work on plasma and whatnot on that, mm -hmm. yes. So there are different people uh, doing on, but uh, my, my inclination is most mathematical one. So different yeah. approaches. Professor Delin? Well, my field is magnetism, so I don't work on black holes. <laughs> right. But uh, for surely, in, it's a very mathematical, math-heavy uh, research subject. Yeah. Uh, is the, do we have questions uh, from the audience uh, that we should uh, have a look at before time runs out too much? Physics feels more distant than chemistry and medicine. Is there any secret to becoming more familiar, getting closer to physics? That's a good question. How do you get closer to physics if you take an interest <laughs> in, uh, in approaching it, but you missed the opportunity when you, were to, when you went to school? Yeah. So physics, I mean, like many other science, I mean, if you can enjoy it, uh, sometimes the uh, initial hurdle it could be high for some people because it has uh, some math and some experimental uh, techniques. You need that. But uh, your uh, curiosity and your desire to learn more, usually you can overcome that uh, small uh, barrier. That's for sure uh, true for all the physicists around the world. Yeah. Yeah. And I would I would add to that that uh, uh, physics is very much in the everyday life. Everybody's uh, when it's slippery on the road, why why do the tires need to look the way they do? It's all these everyday questions. That's physics. So you would do good to have a physics coach close to you to explain those things when, when the questions arise. Yeah, you get to see more things in an uh, easier way. Yeah. <laughs> Could we get I think if you have a curious mind, it will uh, draw you to physics, and then you might have the motivation to learn the mathematics. A curious mind, that's a, that's a good start. Can we get the questions up again? Uh, last two years, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics was to astrophysics. However, astronomy seems to indirect and abstract. What's significant about the Nobel Prize in astrophysics? Any one of you feel inclined? Maybe they Professor Delin. <laughs> Can I start? Um, so it's uh, it's about fundamental discoveries that we understand how the world works in a very general sense. So if we take quantum mechanics, when, uh, when that theory was developed, the, the Dirac and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and so forth, they were not thinking of quantum communication or quantum computers or, or uh, semiconductor technology or anything that we're now using quantum mechanics for. They were curious about how the world actually works. And uh, um, that's really the essence of physics, I would say. Hmm. And may I add, uh, because we are inundated by data these days, we do use a lot of uh, so-called AI uh, technologies these days. Uh, so astronomy uh, and uh, particle physics, we do use all these techniques. And in some sense, we are the forerunners in these fields, actually. That's interesting. I'm I'm curious to how do you how you believe uh, AI and big data will be uh, changing the game of, of the work that you're doing in, in string theory or black holes or nanomagnetism as well. The the new opportunities for yeah. calculations and and uh, uh, management of uh, big data that's hard to see. We saw yeah. some good examples of that. How will that change your yeah. field? So it gives us a. Uh, new tools to look into very complex problems, which we could not uh, uh, do before. So I think it's going to be a real game changer uh, in the near future. Yeah. Professor Delin? Uh, yes. Uh, so um, machine learning uh, can be used uh, in many ways. So it's a very good way of mapping very complex functions on, on some model that you can you develop a very good model. Uh, and uh, this can be used to describe complex many-body uh, wave functions or just states. Uh, 
uh, that we haven't really been able to describe before. So it will give us a better understanding of matter in general. Okay, so maybe that could be an advice to aspiring uh, uh, students, aspiring to becoming a scientist, also to take an interest in that new kind of, uh, of uh, areas. Our time is up. I want to say thank you very much, uh, Professor Delin, for taking the time this morning, and thank Professor Sun Kong Nam yeah. for taking the time this afternoon. Thank you very much, both of you. And we are uh, going to take a little break. It's not going to be very long, but we are going to show uh, a video that exemplifies uh, cooperation between Sweden and Korea. And while you're watching this video, stand up, stretch your legs, get some water or, or uh, do some uh, other small errand. And we'll be back here in uh, a couple of minutes, two, three, four minutes, I believe. Thank you very much. See you in a while. As you have seen, the relation between Korea and Sweden is so broad and it's so deep. Now we're building on the fantastic momentum of last year's 60 years anniversary and we take the relation to the next level. Come collaborate with Sustainable Sweden.
Okay, welcome back from the break. I will let you settle in and find your bearings. Where is the coffee? Where is the seat? Where are the soft cushions? Uh, and then we can resume uh, with the next uh, presentations. And I'm very happy to introduce to you Professor Sven Ledin at Lund University. Professor Ledin has said that the Chemistry Prize is the most important Nobel Prize every year. And I totally agree, of course, that the Chemistry Prize is the most important. And I can see why Professor Ledin would say that. Well, first, because he's a chemist, of course. But also because it connects physics and medicine and is foundational for understanding how processes and change is taking place. And what could possibly be more important than that? I ask you. Professor Ledin is a fellow of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and noted for his work in inorganic chemistry. He served in the Nobel Committee for Chemistry for several years, including as the chair. That gives him inside knowledge in the selection process of candidates for the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. If you have any questions that you would like to ask Professor Ledin about that, you should and you can on the website. There is a Slido function and you can choose your language, either English stream or Korean stream. So please welcome Professor Ledin. You are very welcome indeed. Good to see you. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I'm going to try to put this year's prize into the context of the history of the Nobel Prize and uh, give you a few tips along the way on how to get it, if you should be interested. This is the place where scientists, literatures, and peacemakers strive to be the, uh, the rewarding spot of the Nobel Prize in, the, in Stockholm. It all starts at a press conference in October where the prize is being announced. However, of course, it starts much earlier. It's an ongoing work. And I will give you a few glimpses into how it all started. First of all, the reason that price is there is to some extent because of the uh, chief engineer of Nobel Industries at the time of Nobel's death, Sulman, and some very bad press that Alfred Nobel received when he was an old man. His brother died, and the French papers uh, had the misconception that it was Alfred Nobel who had died, and the headlines were not very pleasing to Alfred Nobel because they read that the merchant of death is dead. He was mostly known at the time for his manufacture of gunpowder and dynamite. And to create something that celebrated peace and the sciences became at the top of his mind. Now, Sulman was important because there really wasn't any reason why anyone should look at the will of Alfred Nobel from the point of view of Swedish law. Because, like his prize, Alfred Nobel was truly international. He was born and raised in Stockholm, lived there the first four years of his life. He then moved to Helsinki, uh, St. Petersburg, Stockholm again, Hamburg, Paris, and finally, San Remo. He was a citizen of the world, and this was a guiding star to why he created the Nobel Prize as an international prize. His will was contested, but according to Swedish law, he was a Swede. This is his summer house uh, in, on the west, in the west of Sweden, Värmland. And according to Swedish law, a man's home is where he keeps his horses. And at the time, Alfred Nobel kept five Russian Orlov stallions at his summer house in Värmland, which made him, according to Swedish law, a sweet, and made it possible for 
the Swedish government to process Alfred Nobel's will as if he were a Swedish citizen, which of course he was, but he was also a citizen of several other countries. What's amazing about his will is that it was considered valid at all. It's handwritten, it contains a lot of extra uh, material, it was changed over time, but it was considered valid. And to our purposes, there are a few things in it that are particularly interesting. First of all, it's interesting to see that he gives some of his money to his relatives, a few hundred thousand crowns. But of course, the central part of this is where he bequests money, the whole of my remaining realizable estate, which was at the time around 35 million Swedish crowns, an enormous amount of money. And those should be given to prizes to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. And importantly, he writes, it's my express wish that in awarding the prizes, no consideration whatever should be given to the nationality of the candidates, but that the most worthy shall receive the prize, whether he be a Scandinavian or not. It's also important that the prizes should be given to those who during the preceding year have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. The Nobel prizes are retrospective. This is a lot easier to follow than to try to predict what is going to be important in the future. And it's also important that the fact that it should be given to the most worthy, uh, whether he be Scandinavian or not, which means we should not pay heed to a political, national, or racial considerations. Interestingly enough, there are different criteria for the chemistry, physics, and medicine or physiology prizes. So how does this happen? Well, somewhere in the world, a forward-looking government or agency decides to send resources on blue sky science because the Nobel Prize is given for new discoveries. And then someone needs to actually make use of this. And 25 years later, the Nobel Committee wakes up from their slumbers. I will get back to why it has to take so long. The yearly cycle works like this. In September, nominations are sent out all over the world to nominate for the Nobel Prize. Uh, they had to be handed in by February. During spring, the Nobel Committee consults with experts around the world concerning the nominations. The report is written during summer. And from September to October, the committee discusses with the Royal Academy of Sciences concerning the choices. And in December, there is a good party and everyone rejoices. This year, we sent out about 3,500 invitations to nominate. We got in excess of 600 nominations of 400 individual candidates. Of about these, there were 30 reports about 200 of the candidates. There were a lot of committee reports and about three months of meeting time and substantial support for the paper and pulp industry because all this is done by traditional media in order to protect the secrecy of the process. What are the trends and challenges then? Well, small or large groups, the prize cannot be given to be shared among more than three individuals. This is a challenge, I think particularly in physics, not so much in chemistry, but it is important to the identity of the prize that it's given to recognizable individuals. Do we really have to wait for 25 years? Well, 
I'll show you a slide about that and get back to this year's price. And what are these subjects today and what were they in the days of Alfred Nobel? The first prize in chemistry went to Jacobus van Hoff, and I think it's important to read from his lecture. Although the investigations on which I'm about to speak were carried out 15 years ago, I'm going to begin by describing still earlier studies which in fact form the basis of my own. Now this is very important. So Jacobus van Hoff was rewarded for work that went back a long time already 1901. And that is still the truth. We are standing on the shoulders of giants and we need to make a very thorough field study in order to find out who really did the job. I would say with this year's prize in chemistry this year, it was remarkably quick. It took less than 10 years to recognize the singular achievement that went behind discovery and the invention, to some extent, of, of how to use CRISPR-Cas9. And Emile Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna received the, the prize unusually early after their discovery, because it so quickly turned out to be so immensely important to mankind. We also have to ask ourselves, what is physics, chemistry, and medicine today? And in reality, they are all intertwined. Prizes that are rewarded in chemistry could very well be awarded in physics or in medicine as well. And there is constant communication between the committees to make sure that if we should look at the same subject, at least we should know so we should not do so unbeknownst to each other. Whenever I speak about the Nobel Prize, I'm always asked about when the first prize or the next prize in the country where I'm speaking, uh, when will this occur? And my answer is always the same. To get the Nobel Prize, you don't only need to be very successful, you also need to be lucky. There are a lot of worthy candidates. And so I have to return the question, do you feel lucky? Do you? <laughs> I have been very much impressed by Korean science. I have followed it very closely. I visit Korea two or three times a year, particularly in conjunction with the, the Huan Prize that gives me a good insight into all the great work that is doing that is done in Korean science. I'm very much looking forward to my next visit there, hoping that we shall again look at a world where travel is possible and where we can engage personally and not only online. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Ledin, or should I say Dirty Harry. Uh, that was uh, fascinating and interesting. Uh, hang on, please, uh, so you can participate in our conversation later on. But first I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Hongbon Kim. He uh, is a, an MD, a medical doctor, uh, and uh, he uh, continued, uh, when he got his uh, uh, doctorate, he continued with research at Yonsei University, to receive a PhD in nanoscience and technology. That's a very interesting, interesting um, topic. He has received the National Young Scientists Award, among other rewards, uh, awards, and is a member of the Young Cast, and is today professor at the Yonsei University. Professor Kim, you're most welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm very pleased to uh, uh, talk about uh, this year Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which is about genome editing. And I have been in this field for the last 10 years, and this is a highly exciting field uh, to research, of research. Uh, next pl slide, please. Ah. So, uh, uh, Yes, this year's Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Downer. So two people, 
became the laureates of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry, and they received this award for the development of a method for genome editing called CRISPR. This is a quote from the Nobel Prize Committee's website. There are three reasons why this award was given to these two people. The first reason is this. It has, this technology has had a revolutionary impact on the life sciences. So the first tense used is a past present tense. And the second reason is this. The technology is contributing to new cancer therapies. So it is currently making contribution. And the third reason is related to the future. So this technology may make the dream of curing inherited diseases come true. Probably it is not sure yet, but this technology may make this dream of curing genetic disease come true. So these are the three reasons why the Nobel Prize was given to this research. These two Nobel laureates received the Breakthrough Prize in 2015. And many scholars in this field anticipated that these two scholars may be receiving the Nobel Prize in the future, but we didn't expect that these people will be receiving the Nobel Prize this shortly. Actually, Emmanuel Chapentier visited Korea in the past. We invited her for a lecture. And this is a slide on the structure of the DNA. DNA is a structure that contains genetic materials. It is consisted of A, T, M, G, and C bases. As we read the genetic materials in the DNA, we will be able to anticipate what kind of characteristics an organism or a human body will look like. So I will just quickly go through these slides. In 2011, Emmanuel Charpentier published this article. This is related to the last component of CRISPR-Cas9, which is the tracer RNA and RNA3. Up until this point, Cas9 and CRISPR RNA were widely known in the field. But this is the structure of CRISPR-Cas9. There is a protein called Cas9, and there is something called CRRNA, which is marked in orange. And there is also a tracer RNA. So this CRISPR-Cas9 is consisted of a tracer RNA and this RNA. And the NGG sequence is shown here. And the other sequences is far from off stream. And there are 20 sequences, as you can see from this slide. And what Emmanuel Charpentier did was to simplify this structure. So the CRISPR RNA and the tra tracer RNA were combined into a single RNA, single guide RNA. So the single guide RNA was created by these two scholars. And the, the single guide RNA is much more effective than the RNAs that existed in the past. So this research was the research that made it possible for them to receive the Nobel Prize. It was submitted in June 2012. and. It was very quickly accepted by a journal called Science in June 2020 also, and it was published in just eight days on June 28th, the same year. And this was a research that was jointly conducted by the two scholars. Next, this is a picture of Feng Zhang and uh, Dr. Kim Jin Su of Korea. And also, there are other scholars who conducted a study on applying this technology on human cells. 
So they proved that gene editing of human cells is possible. Cas9 is a genetic scissor technology, and people think that this is an actual scissor, but let me show you a video of this genetic scissor. The genetic scissor looks like this. The one in the middle is the DNA that looks like a line, and in the middle, it's, there is an object that looks like a ball. Well, it doesn't look like a genetic scissor. It looks like a ball, actually. And this ball will be attached to the DNA, which looks like a string. And then for some time, it works on the DNA to cut the sequence of the DNA. So thanks to their research, there are some literature that came out after this research. So based on the, this theory, there are studies on base editing. And the base polymer here is thymidine. And when the A is cut down, then this A can be transformed into G, and the T can be transformed into C. And all of this technology is thanks to the CRISPR-Cas9 Cas9 technology. And if you put the CRISPR Cas9 to this RNA, then the, these kinds of transformation can happen. And A can be turned into G, G by applying CRISPR-Cas9 genetic scissor. And this space editing technology is developed by a person named David Liu at Harvard University. And recently, there is a research on prime editing. And all these recent works were possible thanks to the CRISPR-Cas9 technology developed by the two scholars who received the Nobel Prize this year. So what kind of benefits can this technology provide to the humanity? It can be used in curing Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other genetic diseases. There are experiments on animals, however, we are not a using this technology in humans yet. Dr. Chin Soo Kim and Jae Young Kim in Korea conducted this research on the treatment of age-related macular degeneration, and they showed the possibility of curing macular degeneration using these uh, gene editing technologies. Also, genetic scissors can be used in cancer therapy. Of course, the cancer cannot be cured completely. However, the size of the cancer cells can significantly be reduced by using this genetic technology. Also, this CRISPR-Cas9 technology can be used in the genome editing of plants. And Recently, together with Professor Yoon Son Ho of the engineering department of our school, we were able to conduct this research on creating a program to predict the activities of genetic scissors. We collected a big data of genetic scissors, and we created a system that can predict the efficacy of genetic scissors. So instead of using an experimental approach, we can come up with a prediction about the efficacy of the genetic disease based on this big data. So using a computer, we can predict the effects of genetic scissor. Uh, scissor. And next year, we will be holding the genetic scissor seminar in September next year in Korea. So I would like to ask you for your participation. Thank you for your introduction. Just to, uh, and welcome back, uh, Professor Ledin. So just a, a quick uh, question first uh, to you, uh, Professor Kim. Uh, is it in use today? I mean, this is a very young technology. It was like 2011, 12, 13, something like that, when they met. 
Yeah, eight. Uh, since 2012, it's eight years. Eight after, years. Uh, for first the, the their paper. So that must you must call that a very young technology. Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, and I had a conversation with the biologist recently, and I asked if they if they are using CRISPR, and they said, well, everybody is. So <laughs> immediately it's uh, taking place in 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 the labs. But is it on experimental level still, or is it treated, uh, or is it used uh, in treatments also? Already, uh, I'm speaking Korean. Prince, uh, uh, yeah. uh, it, well, for in vivo gene editing, up until now, applying this CRISPR Cas9 technology in in vivo treatment. We are already having a clinical trial on such technology to cure an eye-related disease, and I think this is a very promising field. And for ex vivo approach, in cancer immunotherapy, we can get rid of the PD-1 and we can improve the effectiveness of the therapy. And we are already seeing positive results, and we are expecting that this technology is already, the effect of this technology is already proved in cancer treatment. Uh, that's uh, that's interesting, Professor and Professor Lidin. You you showed us, uh, which is very interesting, that uh, there is a very small difference, or can be a very small difference, between uh, medicine and chemistry, uh, for example. And and perhaps this uh, award could have been in the category of uh, medicine or physiology as well. But are so so it's now in the category of chemist chemistry. Are chemists uh, working on CRISPR? Cas9 as well. Is it? It's coming from chemists, but are they constructing the tool, or are is chemists also working with this tool? So there are certainly chemists working on constructing the tool, but there are lots of chemists, many more, using this tool. And I think it's it's uh, it's very interesting to see that it only took a year before the word to CRISPR something yeah. appeared in Swedish. Uh, one year after the publication, it tells you something about the enormous impact of this discovery uh, on chemistry and, of course, on, on life science chemistry uh, in particular. Hmm. Do you need uh, one aspect of this uh, technology that seems to be almost as complicated uh, as the chemistry seems to be the immaterial rights uh, issues and uh, the patents and the protection of the design and so forth. Is it available for everybody to experiment with uh, CRISPR-Cas9? Uh, is it only when you start using it to construct uh, medicine or treatments that uh, the immaterial rights issues become complicated? And, as, and, as, and a connected question to this is, the complexities around the, the immaterial rights and the patents, do you think that can keep people away from doing research on this? Professor? Immaterial rights are very complex in many ways. And uh, I think it's important to, to consider that most research is not done in, in university laboratories. Most research is performed uh, in commercial uh, companies and they are completely dependent on patent rights. And so I think it's important not to demonize patent rights. Uh, they are an important driving force to, to, to make us go forward. Uh, in science, uh, we are certainly free to use the, uh, the results of published, uh, of published reports such as that by, by, by Charpentier and Dagna. Uh, and the patents regarding CRISPR-Cas9 have been largely on the applications rather than on, on new research uh, avenues. So I don't think it's hampering research much. Of course, it does uh, limit the, the commercial applications for other interests, but I think it is a... Um, 
I think it's it's important to realize that this is the only way that companies can join into this research endeavor, and they are also very, very important actors here. Thank you, Professor Kim. And uh, if I uh, able to add on Yes, to add on that, the biggest benefit of CRISPR-Cas9 is that it is really easy to make CRISPR-Cas9. Of course, CRISPR-Cas9 is not the only tool for genome editing. Also, there are other previous tools that were previously developed. However, the reason why CRISPR-Cas9 has become widely popular among scholars is because it's very easy to create Casper 9, Cas9. And probably, if you study this for one or two hours, you'll be able to create CRISPR-Cas9 in just a few days. So anyone can really make this Cas9, and this is the biggest strength of Cas9. And the second strength is that the effectiveness is very high. So I think that is why the award was given to this research. Very well, well, uh, um, well deserved award. Uh, do we have questions? Uh, maybe one question from the audience uh, we could have. We're on overtime now, uh, but thank you for staying with us uh, for just a little bit longer. No, no questions. So there's no time. So we need to uh, wrap up. In that case, I would like to say thank you very much to Professor Kim and thank you very much to Professor Ledin, especially you, Professor Ledin, for going up early this morning. Hope you have a nice rest of the day. And uh, that's it for, for this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I would like to ask back to the stage uh, Ambassador Jakob Hallgren to say a few closing words. Thank you. Well, and, and I would really like to, to thank both uh, Dr. Hector, uh, all of the eminent uh, scholars uh, and researchers and professors who've been with us in these uh, three exciting symposia on the, on the, on the three science prizes uh, this, this year. And, and also thanks to you and the audience for the insightful uh, questions. And having listened at this, I think, wow, this is so accessible. This is so much about everyday issues and and there's so much to take away i'm so i'm sure you have uh, drawn a lot of conclusion each of you who listened who've been us until this but but uh, thus far but uh, the you know the timeless issues about curiosity about persistence about collaboration and about humor that that one of the panelists mentioned uh, earlier i think are are so pertinent it should be fun and it should be spurring the imagination and, and fantasy to, to get to these completely groundbreaking innovations that we have talked about today. And, and you know, I have been in Korea for two years now, and it really strikes me how strong many Koreans are in all of the STEM sciences. So just like Professor Ledin just, uh, just said, uh, I am so curious about the future when it comes to Korea and the Nobel Prize. So, uh, and the other uh, takeaway uh, thus far is that it works great to, to do a seminar or symposia like this despite COVID-19, having the Swedish speakers far away but so, still so close in the, in the online formats here. So, so thanks again to that. But it's not over yet. We're going to break some 20 minutes now. And then uh, we're going to continue this session today with a symposia on the Economics Nobel Prize and later on also on the Literature Nobel Price. So please stay tuned and hang on uh, for the next session in a moment. Thank you so very much.